Efforts to gather critical weather data evolved into a high-stakes game of cat and mouse between the Germans and the Allies. Weather has been an important factor throughout the course of human history. A typhoon was responsible for the destruction of Kublai Khan's invasion fleet, which resulted in the failure of his effort to conquer Japan. Because of the oppressive heat of summer and the freezing cold of winter, Napoleon's Grand Army was unable to survive his disastrous war in Russia. They were laid low by the extreme temperatures. Even during the Battle of Waterloo, the battlefield was transformed into a quagmire by the torrential rains, which contributed to his ultimate defeat. The creation of the airplane, the tank, and the modern ship increased the significance of the weather during the 20th century. However, the weather became even more essential then. Weather conditions that are unfavorable could cause bombers and other aircraft to be grounded, or fog or clouds could disguise their targets. In addition, land offensives were dependent on accurate weather forecasts, and during sea battles, convoys carrying essential supplies required accurate weather forecasts in order to successfully deliver their cargoes. In the periodical World War II history, you will find additional information regarding the occurrences and conditions that had a role in the formation of the Second World War. During the 1940s, meteorologists relied on barometers and other old, time-honored techniques rather than new equipment such as satellite imaging. This was because satellite imagery was not yet available. Despite this, meteorologists were able to produce predictions that were reasonably accurate up to three days in advance. At the beginning of the war in 1939, the Germans found themselves in a position of disadvantage when it came to the collection and interpretation of historical meteorological data. The Arctic regions of the Northern Hemisphere are the ones where European weather begins to evolve, and it eventually moves from west to east. It was impossible for Germany to establish any colonies in the area that could serve as reporting stations. There were a number of good spots for weather reporting, such as Greenland, Jan Mayen Island, and the Svalbard Archipelago. But, at the time, Denmark and Norway held these locations. The neutrality of Scandinavia during the early months of the war ultimately proved to be beneficial to the Germans. For instance, the weather stations on Greenland regularly relayed information in simple international code. This was the case in Greenland. The similar thing was done by the meteorologists working on Jan Mayen Island in Norway. However, everything changed on April 9, 1940, when Hitler attacked Denmark and Norway along with Norway. The island colonies were left to fend for themselves when their home countries were occupied while they were under occupation. In lieu of working with the Nazis, the majority of people opted for resistance, even if it was a passive form of resistance. As a result of the German annexation of their homelands, the majority of Danes and Norwegians living outside of Denmark began to cooperate with the Britain and the United States. As the summer of 1940 approached, the Germans discovered that they were in the midst of a complicated situation. They were victorious in Scandinavia, but the very fact that they were successful put their future operations in jeopardy. The Danish and Norwegian weathermen who were stationed overseas now provided the Allies with their information. They were appalled by the savage subjugation committed against their countries. Admiral Karl Donitz and his submarines were the choice that the Germans made when they were looking for a solution to a situation that was getting worse over time. Between the months of August 1940 and January 1941, Two German U-boats were given the responsibility of serving as weather reporting stations on a full-time basis. It was difficult for Donitz to complete these tasks because he believed that the collection of meteorological data, regardless of how important it was, was secondary to the sinking of enemy ships. At first glance, the commitment appeared to be very minor. Nevertheless, due to turnovers, transits, and refits, a total of six submarines were actually included in the program. However, only 27 of the 57 submarines that Donitz had at the beginning of the war were ocean-going, 
long-range type VIIs. An initial plan called for the deployment of 300 U-boats to patrol the Atlantic Ocean. However, the war broke out much too quickly for these forecasts to become a reality. The Admiral was vehemently opposed to the concept of his priceless U-boats being utilized in such a pedestrian fashion. In January of 1941, German U-boats ultimately disengaged from their full-time commitment, much to Donitz's relief. Despite this, they continued to collect weather data on occasion when they were undertaking other missions. As time went on, U-boats were also used to transfer equipment, carry base supplies, and transport weather workers to and from weather station locations. In addition, the German Luftwaffe carried out weather reconnaissance patrols that extended all the way to Greenland. Regular flights across the icy waters of the Arctic were conducted by Stalbert 5, also known as Weather Squadron 5, which was based in Trondheim and Banach, Norway. These flights took place twice a day, specifically configured Henkel He 111s, Junkers Ju 88s, and Ju 52s and Dornier Du-17s were utilized by the squadron. The nose art of these aircraft featured the characteristic Flying Frog logo that was associated with the squadron. The Weather Squadron 5 was forced to contend with the harsh circumstances of the Arctic, which included fluctuations in temperature, icing, and engine issues. Both the anti-aircraft defenses of the Allies in Spitsbergen and other locations as well as the fighters of the Allies, suffered defeat. But in the end, getting weather information through the air was not trustworthy enough. In a strange twist of fate, flights were frequently canceled because airplanes were grounded due to adverse weather conditions. The Germans made the decision to send weather ships, which were trawlers that served as fishing vessels, and were thus able to avoid discovery by the Allies while simultaneously providing crucial meteorological data into the waters of the North Atlantic. The program involving the weather trawler was not only unsuccessful, rather, it was an absolute catastrophe. The fact of the matter is that one may argue that it was one of the most significant factors that led to Germany's loss. It was unfortunate for the Nazis that the British were monitoring weather ship transmissions to such a degree that they were able to eliminate the element of surprise on their side. The British Royal Navy chased the weather trawlers with unrelenting determination until eventually they were either sunk or captured one by one. The Royal Navy invested a significant amount of time, effort, and resources in the acquisition of these weather ships However, this was not just due to the fact that they were transmitting meteorological data. These weather trawlers were equipped with Enigma cipher machines, which were equipment that were capable of sending and receiving communications in the German Enigma code, which was a secret code. The Enigma code was broken by the British with the assistance of cryptographic equipment, rotors, and other similar items that were provided by each weather trawler that was captured. However, the Germans eventually came to the realization that the trawlers were too susceptible to hostile action. Although they never fully realized why their weather missions endangered Enigma, they did eventually come to this realization. As time went on, it became increasingly apparent that the only stations capable of providing the precise weather data required to formulate reliable forecasts were those that were located on land. On the other hand, in 1940, every conceivable site was either in the hands of the Allies or anti-Nazi forces, which made the work ahead of the Germans that much more challenging. On the other hand, these potential locations for weather stations were located in extremely isolated and desolate regions that were notorious for their high cold temperatures and natural hazards. Threats such as attacks by polar bears were something that humans had to live with. Considering the remoteness of these places, it is probable that it would be possible to create bases that would not be discovered. After carefully examining a map, it became abundantly clear that Greenland, Spitsbergen, and Jan Mayen Island were among the most advantageous locations for the collection and transmission of weather data. All of them were located in the Arctic regions, 
which are home to the formation of European weather fronts, and they were all far enough away to provide the Germans with at least a chance of success. In addition to that, weather stations had previously been established earlier. Should the German Navy, known as the Kriegsmarine, take prompt action, it may be possible for them to establish bases before the British could take any countermeasures. Jan Mayen Island is a barren rock that is only 34 miles long. The most notable feature of the island is the Barrenberg Volcano, which is 7,470 feet tall and covered in snow. It is owned by Norway, but it does not have any natural resources, but it is perfect for reporting weather. The year 1940 found four Norwegian meteorologists living in Jan Mayen. These meteorologists were responsible for providing accurate weather data to their home country, the German invasion which they had heard about on their radio, left them in a state of shock and appall. At that moment, the meteorologists instantly stopped transmitting to Norway and started providing reports to the British. Additionally, they asked for assistance from the British because they were concerned that the Germans may attempt to physically occupy the island for themselves. British officials acted with alacrity, sent the free Norwegian warship Fritjof Nansen, with a crew of 68 men to support the meteorologists and garrison the island against the Germans. After arriving in October 1940, the Fritjof Nansen was unable to continue its journey because it ran aground on one of Jan Mayen's underwater reefs. Due to the fact that the ship was a complete and utter failure, the Norwegians were momentarily separated from the people of the weather station that they had come to help. The onset of winter was accompanied by storms and a nearly complete absence of light. It was decided to temporarily surrender Jan Mayen to the elements as a result of the shifting conditions that brought about this decision. The newly isolated troops radioed British authorities and then settled down to await assistance. The food situation was an issue, but luckily polar bears prowled the area in their relentless search for seals. Two or three of the enormous creatures were shot and added to the larder. By the time the rescue ship appeared, the seas were rough with white-foamed water pounding against the island rocks. It took ten trips to ferry the stranded Norwegians to the rescue ship over dangerous seas. The four original meteorologists were the last to quit the island, but before they departed, they destroyed their radio equipment and everything else that might be of value to the Germans. The British expected to reoccupy Jan Mayen in the spring. The Germans quickly became aware of the fact that the island had been silent. Jan Mayen did not have any radio traffic originating from a radio station. They dispatched reconnaissance aircraft from Norway, which proved that the island was devoid of any inhabitants during their investigation. An instant interest in the issue was shown by the German Abwehr, which is the country's intelligence service. The conventional thinking was that no one in his right mind would attempt an expedition to Jan Mayen, so soon to the arrival of winter. However, if the Germans proceeded with promptness, they might be able to land a crew before the really harsh weather and darkness set in. Although it was a risk, it was a calculated risk that would result in great returns in terms of meteorological data. Almost immediately, a meteorological unit was established and given the name Sonderkommando Graf Finkelstein after its aristocratic commander, Ulrich Graf, Count von Finkelstein. As was characteristic of the Nazis during this time period, TRIP was an inter-service one and involved overlapping authorities and duties. Additionally, the makeup of the mission was rather ambiguous. Heinrich Fries, a fishing trawler, would be the vessel that would transport the teams. Lieutenant Wilhelm Crack would serve as the captain, while 13 civilian seamen would make up the crew. Trondheim, Norway was the location of the departure of the Heinrich Fries on November 12, 1940. In addition to the personnel, there were three separate units that were present on board. A Luftwaffe weather troop consisting of three men and led by Lieutenant Harold Brunn, was the first group to arrive. Following that, there were two radiomen from the intelligence, service known as Abwehr Funkier, 
who were responsible for transmitting meteorological information to Europe. Last but not least, there was the Sonderkommando Graf Finkelstein, which was a group that included the Count, Dane Kurt Carlos Hansen, who had turned traitor, and three other men. It was unfortunate for the Germans that the British were not willing to take any chances with Jan Mayen, which they referred to as Island X, the Royal Navy, having made the decision that it was imperative that the island be maintained out of the hands of the Germans at all costs, kept a close eye on the island and its approaches, because of the turbulent seas and the rapid approach of winter. The patrols were laborious and frequently perilous, yet the British tenacity was eventually rewarded with good results. However, despite the fact that the Hinrich Freeze arrived in Jan Mayen without any mishaps on November 16, 1940, its good fortune did not carry over. It was the light cruiser HMS Nyad that was successful in capturing the German trawler before it could land its weather crew and equipment. The attempt to flee was made by Hinrich Fries, and Nyad gave pursuit. There are two different accounts of what took place after that. According to one description, the German captain attempted to steer his ship through the dangerous rocks, but he was unsuccessful in his endeavor. The Germans are said to have intentionally sunk the ship in order to avoid being captured, according to the majority of accounts. Whatever the case may be, Hinrich Fries collided with the lava rocks, and the force of the impact caused the vessel to shake from the bow to the stern. Because the waves were so strong, the lifeboats had a tough time being launched because they were constantly being pushed into the sides of the German trawler that was sinking. The lifeboats were engulfed by enormous waves, which caused them to become submerged and forced the survivors to enter the icy water. Not only did two people drown, but the remaining individuals who were drenched Weary and icy, made it to the coast, only to be rescued by a British landing force. When the free Norwegian ship Valakati arrived in Jan Mayen on March 10, 1941, it brought with it 12 Norwegian meteorologists. This marked the return of the Allies to Jan Mayen. Along with the addition of some anti-aircraft guns, the population of the island increased over the course of time to include a small garrison. Do the Germans started conducting airstrikes on the meteorological station. The latter were required due of the situation. It is not difficult for German bombers with long-range capabilities to reach Jan Mayen Island, which is located approximately 600 miles west of Norway. Falk Wolf Fo 200 Condor bombers which were equipped with four engines, made repeated visits for a period of time, but caused very little substantial damage. There was a risk of adverse weather conditions and the presence of anti-aircraft guns belonging to the Allies. Thus, this was hardly a milk run for Luftwaffe flying personnel. One of the island's mountainsides was the location of a Fock Wolf 200 that went down on August 7, 1941, the aircraft was lost in dense fog. A total of nine members of the crew were killed, and fragments of the wreckage are still there to this day. A second German plane was discovered on the southwest part of the island in 1950, and its debris was discovered there. Towards the end of 1941, the Germans had abandoned any notion of capturing the island despite the fact that they continued to conduct nuisance bombing raids on a periodic basis. Spitsbergen was another region that the Germans were interested in establishing meteorological stations and during their never-ending search for new locations. There are approximately 280 miles in length on this island, and its width ranges from 25 to 140 miles. The Norwegian government owns the island of Spitsbergen, which is a part of the Svalbard Archipelago. The invasion of the Soviet Union by Hitler in June of 1941 gave it an even larger significance than it already had. Spitsbergen was a region that possessed substantial coal reserves, in addition to its advantageous location for gathering weather information. There were a few coal mines on the island that were run by Norwegian companies while others were under the administration of the Russian-Russian Federation. 
as a result of the dangers posed by seasonal ice. Preliminary examinations determined that Spitsbergen could not serve as a naval station for the Allies. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, was the driving force behind a plan that advocated for bold and decisive action. There would be a complete evacuation of the whole inhabitants of the island, with the Russians being sent back to the Soviet Union and the Norwegians being sent to Britain. It was not difficult for Moscow and the Norwegian government that was living in exile to approve of the plan. Following its departure on August 19, 1941, the mission, which was given the codename Operation Gauntlet, arrived a few days later. Both Canadian troops and members of the Royal Navy's Force K, which was commanded by Rear Admiral Philip Vienne, participated in the British effort. The troops were transported by the Liner Empress of Canada, which was accompanied by the flagship of Vian, the cruiser AHMS Nigeria, the cruiser AHMS Aurora, three destroyers, and several smaller support ships. There was a lack of information on whether or not the Germans had occupied the island at present. They had not done so, and the Norwegian, Russian immigrants who lived in the area were more than willing to cooperate. It was decided to evacuate the miners, and demolition teams were dispatched to the mines in order to destroy them and any excess fuel stocks. During the time that the demolition was still going on, radio stations on the island continued to broadcast as if everything was fine. They even sent out phony weather forecasts that said there was heavy fog in order to discourage German aviation surveillance. These radio stations were not destroyed until after the task had been successfully performed. The number of Russians and Norwegians who were removed from Spitsbergen was at least 1,955 and 765 respectively. Despite the fact that the operation was successful, the Germans made another attempt to take advantage of the void that was left behind by the withdrawal of the Allies much as they had done with Jan Mayen Island. Even though it took them a few days to figure out what was going on, once they did, they responded quickly to prevent further damage. A meteorological team from the Luftwaffe, consisting of 10 individuals, successfully landed on the northeastern corner of the island, where a landing strip had been fashioned out of the arid soil. A total of roughly four tons of supplies were transported by the Luftwaffe throughout the month of October in 1941. By the 11th of November, a number of weather stations in Germany were operating at full capacity. During the winter of 1941 to 1942, Station Banso was located in Advent Dallen, close to Longyearbyen, and Station Nelsby was sending out transmissions in the vicinity of Rossford. On the other hand, the Allies were not going to stand by and watch as the Nazis took possession of the island without putting up a fight. The fact that they had to wait until the severe winter in the Arctic had passed was irritating, but they had no choice. For the subsequent half year, the weather stations in Germany were exempt from any kind of interference. Spitsbergen was the destination of the ships Isbjorn and Selles which landed in May 1942 with approximately 80 Norwegian ski troopers. Their mission was to expel the Germans and establish Allied sovereignty over the island. After safely sailing up the Green Ford, also known as the Green Fjord, the ships anchored in order to offload their cargo. They were severely destroyed as a result of an attack by foe 200s that took place on the evening of May 14th. One of the ships was destroyed by fire, and the other was sunk by the sun. In spite of the fact that 14 Norwegians were killed during the air raid, the remaining Norwegians were able to successfully leave ship and make it to shore after plunging into water that was below freezing and climbing onto ice floes that were nearby. A story that was published in a contemporary issue of Time magazine states that they arrived at Barentsburg, but that their mission was a complete and utter failure. It was no longer possible to hear their radio. They had only been able to save 15 skiffs, a few weapons, and a solitary lamp that had shattered, and they were burdened by others who had been injured. 
By utilizing the lamp that they had rescued, they were fortunate enough to be able to signal a consolidated PBY Catalina flying boat that was belonging to the British Coastal Command. The British landed on June 2 with troops and supplies, and their message was received by the British by that point. When the Norwegian ski troops arrived on the island, they began searching for the German stations that had evaded them. According to one report, there was a confrontation that resulted in the death of one German. On the other hand, the majority of the German weather stations just stopped functioning and disappeared with the wind. It was a submarine that was used to evacuate the weather teams. Despite the fact that the Germans had left Spitsbergen, they had left behind an automated weather station that had been able to successfully send meteorological data throughout the entire summer of 1942. Spitsbergen was under the entire control of Norwegian forces that were free at this point in time. The island defenses of the Allies consisted of machine guns and some artillery measuring three inches. Despite the fact that the tide of battle was turning against them by this point, which was late 1942 and early 1943, the Germans steadfastly refused to give up and surrender. Near October of 1942, the Kriegsmarine landed a six-man crew near Rossford, which they referred to as Station Nussbaum. This was done in the northern region of the country. When it came to locating this will-o'-the-wisp station, the Norwegians were never successful. Towards the end of the summer of 1943, Adolf Hitler took the decision to launch a large assault against Spitsbergen, despite the fact that the mission made little sense from a military standpoint. Both North Africa and the German summer offensive at Kursk were unsuccessful. North Africa was given up on. It is possible that Hitler, who was frustrated by these events, sought satisfaction in a victory that was simple and inexpensive. As a matter of fact, the operation on Spitsbergen, which was either nicknamed Citronella or Sicilian, was excessive from the very beginning. The battleship Tirpitz, the cruiser Scharnhorst, and nine destroyers were among the surface units that participated in the Citronella operation. These boats were among the most powerful in the German inventory. A landing party consisted of a battalion of German soldiers deployed to the area. One could hardly expect the free Norwegian garrison, which consisted of approximately 100 men, to be able to hold up against such an armada. In the morning of September 6, 1943, the German Navy arrived at Spitsbergen, which caught the Norwegians completely off guard. With its 15-inch cannons, Tirpitz opened fire on Longyearbyen and Barentsburg, causing the settlements to catch fire and resulting in the deaths of a number of the garrison members. The German cruisers Scharnhorst and the others added their guns to the onslaught that was being launched. Almost immediately, the Norwegian three-inch guns were silenced, which made it possible for the German troops to land on the shore. Although they battled valiantly, the Norwegians were ultimately defeated. Troops from Norway were killed, while 41 others were taken prisoner. However, a significant number of the garrison members managed to flee into the interior and were never captured. This was the first and last time that the Tirpitz fired its guns in anger, and it occurred during the Citronella campaign. The Germans had a difficult time coordinating their fire, and at one point, the powerful Tirpitz was actually firing 15-inch shells at its own soldiers. After the Germans had successfully taken control of the island, they immediately began the process of demolishing all of the Allied infrastructure, including the crucial meteorological station. After a few days, the German Navy was compelled to retreat despite the best efforts of its commanders. Their situation was simply too precarious and unsustainable to continue. Following the withdrawal of the German forces, the Allied forces reoccupied the island and reconstructed all of the facilities. There would never be another instance of the Nazis coming in such a large force. But the landing and withdrawal of meteorological teams would continue to be a game of cat and mouse. Greenland is the largest island in the world, 
covering an area that is greater than 827,000 square miles. It is estimated that around 80% of the area is covered by thick glaciers, and the only coast that is generally amenable to civilization is the southwestern coast. In 1940, there were only about 20,000 people living there, the majority of whom were native Eskimo, but there were also some Danes and some Norwegians. A small group of Danish civil workers were responsible for the administration of Greenland, which was a colony of Denmark. A Danish individual by the name of Eskbrun was in charge of this vast region that included mountains, glaciers, and fjords in the year 1940. After the German invasion of his homeland, he made the assumption, which was correct, that Hitler would have power over Denmark and that Denmark would be compelled to act in accordance with Nazi demands. Despite the fact that he was still able to contact with Copenhagen, was unable to entirely trust any commands that came from home. The only thing that could be done was to transform Greenland into a nation that would be considered independent for the length of the conflict. Rum was particularly concerned about the east coast of Greenland, which is 1600 miles long and consists of a bleak westland. It is possible that the Germans will make an effort to erect meteorological stations or perhaps military bases in that area, and Brunn will be unable to prevent them from doing so. Consultations were held with the Americans, who maintained their formal neutrality, but made it quite apparent that they did not desire a German base in North America. The Americans came to the conclusion that the majority of the small population that lived in eastern Greenland should be relocated to the southern region. The presence of intruders would be more easily detected in this manner. Although Brunn was in agreement, what if the Germans did show up? No one would be able to detect their presence. Brunn established the Northeast Greenland Sledge Patrol, which consisted of a small group of Eskimos, Danes, and Norwegians who shared the responsibility of maintaining a vigilant watch over the shore. There were approximately 15 men who served as sledge patrollers, and their headquarters were located in the remote village of Sleminess. Prior to the conflict, the most of them had been lonely hunters or trappers, and they had a profound familiarity with the vast wilderness that was covered in snow. In accordance with the name, patrols were conducted by a sledge and dog team, between 70 and 77 degrees north, which is approximately 500 miles, was their range. Despite the fact that the United States had not yet established the sledge patrol, they had already begun to take an active interest in Greenland. The Danish ambassador to the United States, Dr. Henrik de Kaufmann, had a meeting with President Franklin D. Roosevelt the day after the Germans invaded his country. After extending his warmest greetings to Kaufman, Roosevelt promptly invoked the Monroe Doctrine. The United States of America would not tolerate any outside foreign presence in North America, despite the fact that it did not change its neutrality. Over the course of the conflict, Greenland evolved into a protectorate of the United States of America for the duration of each conflict. Is it possible that the Germans will make a move? In the fall of 1940, the Norwegian supply ship Valakati, which was carrying Danish and Norwegian hunters as well as 50 armed pro-German collaborators, was captured by the Norwegian cruiser Fritjof Nansen. This provided the answer to the question. The initial objective of their mission was to take the weather station located at Midbet and transmit meteorological reports to the Luftwaffe. If it weren't for the timely intervention of Fritjof Nansen, they probably would have been successful in their task. These events took place in June and July of 1941. Admiral Harold Stark, who was known as the Chief of Naval Operations, was the one who was responsible for organizing the Greenland Patrol. It was ordered that the Greenland Patrol provide assistance to the United States. As part of the latter's efforts to develop air bases in Greenland, the Army participated. The primary objective, however, was to protect Greenland and specifically block German operations in Northeast Greenland. In the United States, Commander Edward Iceberg Smith 
who is considered to be something of a legend, was given command of the patrol. She is a veteran of the Arctic climate and a member of the Coast Guard. Despite the fact that Smith's assignment consisted of a little bit of everything, he stated that the Coast Guard was accustomed to performing such tasks. Unknown individuals were observed at the entrance of Franz Joseph Jord in September of 1941, according to a report made by the Sledge Patrol Department. The United States of America is currently on high alert. Cutter Northland of the United States Coast Guard made the discovery of a Norwegian fishing boat known as the Bosco around 300 miles south of the other sightings. After being questioned, the crew eventually revealed that they had landed a party that was equipped with a radio transmitter. After conducting a thorough search, the Northland sent a shore team consisting of 12 individuals, led by Lieutenant Leroy McCluskey to inspect a hunter's hut that appeared to be suspicious. With their rifles ready, the shore party surrounded the shack in order to ensure that no one inside could potentially escape. Following the arrival of his troops, McCluskey pride opened the door with a kick and stormed inside while holding a revolver drawn. Inside, there were three Germans who had been shocked, and they did not put up any resistance. Despite the fact that the hut included radio equipment, the Germans appeared to be almost relieved that they had been taken. The individuals presented McCluskey with a cup of coffee and then lit a fire in order to warm it up. The sharp-eyed lieutenant saw that this was a hoax, an attempt to steal their code book from the Americans before they could take possession of it. The book was saved by McCluskey at the very last moment. It is commonly believed that the Bosco was the first American Navy vessel to be captured during the Second World War. Due to the fact that the United States was neutral at the time and Pearl Harbor was almost three months away, the allegation is technically incorrect. In point of fact, the Germans and their Norwegian compatriots were not taken into custody as prisoners of war, but rather as illegal immigrants. 1943 was the year when the Germans made their most audacious and, for a period of time, most successful excursion into Greenland. There was a weather crew aboard the German trawler Saken that sailed to Sabine Island on Hansa Bay in the month of August. Sabine Island is located close to the coast of Greenland and is only approximately 70 miles away from the sledge patrol base in Sliminess. According to reports, Lieutenant Hermann Ritter, an Austrian who was not a member of the Nazi party and who was in charge of the expedition, did not show much excitement for the mission. The proximity of the Sledge Patrol headquarters to Ritter was another source of discomfort for him, at least when measured against the standards of the Greenland wilderness. The German weather crew, which was given the codename Hollage, was able to effectively install a station, and after that, they hid away for the winter. In the spring, as Marius Jensen, a sledge patroller, and two Eskimos were approaching Sabine Island, they were taken aback to find tracks in the snow. It had been traversed by men wearing boots with heels. Eventually, Jensen and his buddies came across a hut that appeared to be occupied, and it was clear that these individuals were not familiar with them. As soon as Jensen entered the deserted cabin, his attention was immediately pulled to a jacket. The people who had been living there had vanished, but they could still be seen as minuscule dots in the distance. A swastika was used as the emblem. Already, the Germans had arrived. The alert was disseminated by Jensen, who was successful in returning to sliminess. The idea that the sledge patrollers were civilians and that they might engage in a firefight with the Germans occurred to Governor Brunn before he made his decision. In the event that they were captured, the Nazis had the potential to execute them as partisans or bandits. Brunn formally changed the patrol into the Greenland Army in order to make them legal fighters. In addition to others receiving various ranks, its leader, IBM Poulsen, was promoted to the rank of captain. As a result, these approximately 15 soldiers became the smallest official army throughout the Second World War. However, 
the men did not have much time to make the most of their newly acquired status. The Germans carried out an unexpected attack on slimminess and set fire to the city, destroying it completely. However, the destruction of the base was a defeat for the Allies, despite the fact that the few patrollers who were present at the time were able to escape. Sledge patroller Eli Knudsen was killed by machine fire by the Germans as they were returning to their base on Sabine Island. The Germans encountered him while they were on their way back. His survival was a priority for Ritter. After that, two further sledge patrollers were taken into custody. Marius Jensen, one of the inmates, discovered Ritter by himself and turned the tables on the German. He took Ritter into custody and marched him to the American holding facility, which was located around 300 miles south. During this period, American bombers were able to find the weather station on Sabine Island and destroy it to ruins. During the same operation, the trawler Saken ran aground and was destroyed. The crew of the Saken and its meteorological team hid and abandoned the weather station when it was destroyed. They remained there until they were rescued by a flying boat one month later. One of the members of the team, Rudolf Sentz, was left behind, and a coast patrol from the Northland eventually captured him as a prisoner. When 1944 rolled along, the tide of battle had turned against Germany, and the country's resources were beginning to run out. Nevertheless, the Nazis continued to send covert missions to the Arctic, because they believed that weather reporting was still of such great importance. There was a German weather station at Cape Sussy that was discovered and destroyed by the Northland in the month of July. After some time had passed, Northland found the German trawler Kober, which had been engulfed in ice and had been destroyed by fire. In a desperate attempt to avoid defeat, the Germans planned to establish three extra meteorological stations in the Arctic. They were clinging to any and all possible solutions. In the first expedition, Lieutenant Weiss, who was also known by his love code name Edelweiss, served as mission commander. The second one was given the name Goldschmidt and was commanded by Lieutenant Carl Schmidt, who also held a PhD a third attempt, which was given the code name Hal Degen, was dispatched to Spitsbergen by the submarine U-307. At the time of its capture by the omnipresent cutter Northland, the weather expedition Edelwes was traveling on the trawler Kingen. It took seven and a half hours for the German trawler to become ensnared in the ice and eventually sink. Officers and crew members of the vessel were taken into custody. With the introduction of a new category of ice-breaking cutter, the United States Coast Guard was able to acquire more advanced and potent weapons inside its arsenal. Among these was the United States ship East Wind, which was dispatched to Greenland's Little Coldwee Island in response to a report of suspicious activities on the island. A landing force that had been particularly trained and was the first of its kind in the history of the Coast Guard was on board and swiftly went ashore to investigate. In the absence of a single shot being fired, the Americans were able to surprise and capture the 12-person Goldschmidt weather party. Following the triumph of the east wind, the ship that had initially landed the Goldschmidt squad was located and captured by the east wind. Immediately following the firing of some warning shots by east wind, the German trawler Externs team capitulated. The sole German surface warship that was taken by American forces during the Second World War was the Externstein, which was captured at sea. The cluster of huts that comprised weather station Hal Degen was extravagant in comparison to other Arctic communities. There was a dormitory with seven beds and a library with 20 books present among the facilities. On May 7, 1945, the German personnel who consisted of both technologists and troops, received the news of the German capitulation through the medium of radio. A peculiar intermission occurred over the course of the subsequent few months, during which the Germans continued to broadcast weather data, but they did so in plain transmissions that were devoid of any code. In September of 1945, 
They were the final German unit to surrender during the Second World War. They did so to a Norwegian ship, which was the final German unit to surrender. Forty years after the German surrender, the weather war had a peculiar postscript that was written in Canada. Beginning on October 22, 1943, the German submarine U-537 arrived at Martin Bay in northern Labrador. This marked the beginning of the conflict. Dr. Kurt Sommer Meyer, a meteorologist, and his assistant were on board, and the primary objective of their mission was to establish an automated weather station. To ensure that the installation remained a secret, every effort was made. Due to the fact that there was a possibility that it may be found by Allied forces, every effort was taken to divert the attention of anybody who could be interested in it. It was emblazoned with the inscription, Canadian Weather Service, and the ground was covered in the butts of American cigarettes. Following Dr. Summer Meyer's inspection to ensure that the station was operating, as intended, the Germans continued their journey to Europe. Unfortunately, Weather from Gate, WFL, no, 26, also known as Weather Station Kurt, was only operational for a few days at a time. It's possible that Kurt's transmission stopped working due to bad batteries or some other source of difficulty. It wasn't until the 1980s that no one remembered Weather Station Kurt. Sommermeyer had already passed away by this point, but his documents were still in their original state which provided a researcher with hints to the location of the station. Canisters, a tripod, a mast, and dry cell batteries were all included in the relocation of the station that took place in 1981, a physical representation of an interesting event that occurred during the Second World War. Weather Station Kurt is currently on exhibit at the Canadian War Museum. This serves as a tangible remembrance of that event.